everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, of course, you all know me, Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. And tonight I'm joined by Professor Leslie Tenzer at Pace Law. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I mean, you know, I'm as good as I can be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're a law school professor. You've made this transition to teaching law school online over mm -hmm. Zoom, as many law mm -hmm. schools have. And you've also got the Law to Fact podcast as mm -hmm. well. So you're no stranger to the internet world and legal education online. And so I'm curious just what it's been like for you moving law school education online as a professor over the course of the spring semester. Now that the semester is kind of drawn to a close, what are your, your reflections on this experiment? Well, Steve, thanks again for inviting me. I always enjoy speaking with you and I do love your blog and recommend it to people who are about to go to law school. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about where I am in all of this. I teach contracts, which is a first year law school class, and I teach an upper law school class called sales. And I taught both of them in the spring. And interestingly enough, my contract class was going to be in the classroom the entire time. But the sales class was going to be half in the classroom and half online. Now, one of the things I've learned is there's two ways to deliver online information. One is synchronistically and one is asynchronistically. So synchronistically is when we're all in the room together and asynchronistically is when we're not. And that was how I was delivering this class in the spring was one hour, one, um, one hour and a half was gonna be asynchronistic and one hour we were gonna be in the classroom. So I had the advantage of learning a little bit about how to do this online um, stuff ahead of time. But it did not prepare me for this synchronistic experience. And what that entailed was modifying the way we teach law school. So the way we teach law school, particularly 1L law school, is that we really are as, not as concerned with the law because all the laws on Google, all the laws in the library, we're trying to teach students how to think like a lawyer so that when they go to a courtroom, they can make a legally based argument. Um, and so that requires the Socratic method, a lot of asking and answering. And I'm very, the Socratic method is super important to me. So I had to figure out how to deliver the, the Socratic method synchronistically. And what I ended up doing was continuing my, my Socratic method, calling on students that I saw in the Zoom room, and also um, using a PowerPoint to kind of guide us through. I taught that the second half, I guess, starting in March, and I'm actually teaching again summer semester, so I've been doing it again now. And guess what? It's not horrible. It's actually, there are some very definite pros. I've, I've become very comfortable teaching Socratically. The students who are on the spot are always on the spot. I think for the students, the hardest part is staying engaged when dogs are walking across their laps and I, you, parents are coming in the room and they have to share computers. So it's, it's, it's and just having a computer, I know myself, you know, the, the, the pull of, you know, reading, you know, the newest Daily Mail post, or <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit, or something like that is very hard. So it is incumbent upon the students. But for me, I got to know the students even better than I did before because I looked at them face to face much more closely. And the other thing I did, and I did it quite often, was I would put students into breakout rooms and it allowed me to go into each of these breakout rooms. So every third class, I would put students into breakout rooms, give them assignments, and then say, how are you doing, how are you doing, how are you doing? I have to say, and I'm not suggesting that I'm the greatest teacher or anything like that, but I do feel proud of the way I delivered the information. I just graded my first set of finals and I was thrilled with the responses. Um, I thought there was a really big learning curve for students to know the decorum of being online. I was surprised the first time I taught it how many kids were still in bed, people who were vaping while I was teaching, people were texting and I'll, you know, I, you know, I'd say like, let's put this down, I'd see it. Um, but I started, uh, one of the things I did, I know I'm rambling, was I used to play High School Musical, we're all in this together, and then with that moved on to other pump up music. And I think that kind of gave us all a spree de corps. So I know that was a bit of a ramble, but I guess my enthusiasm is that, well, this is clearly not my pro you know, prerogative. It isn't horrible. No, it's very interesting. It's very interesting to hear what it's like on your end of things. And so from what you're saying, I gather that it may not be ideal, but it actually has some benefits. 
I think that's fair to say. And I also think, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of talk in the papers. Should I go to college? Should I take a gap year? Graduate school is different. And while the camaraderie is important, I think the most important part is learning how to think like an attorney. And I think that if I had a child who was deciding whether to go to law school, knowing what I know now, I really do think that the, the quality of education is not that bad. And actually, interestingly enough, the American Bar Association has been very reluctant to allow online learning. And I suspect that this, once we're back in the classroom, will change and we, they will be more forgiving of online learning because you really can learn online. You know, I think, the, again, as I said before, the biggest issue is coming upon the student to stay focused. Right, right, of course. And I've been following that ABA, the ABA standards around this as well because a lot of students in the Elsa Unplugged Facebook community, for example, are interested in the online law school aspect. If they can't go in person, they're worried about what's going to happen in the fall. And it's interesting for you to, to hear you say that the online aspect isn't that bad, especially if COVID requires it to some extent, mm -hmm. especially for mm -hmm. entering 1Ls in the fall. So I'm wondering, given your experience in the spring, you talked about things like breakout rooms, seeing students face-to-face, face -face, the decorum and such as well. I'm wondering what tweaks you might make or that schools might make in general to improve the online experience, perhaps for the summer, but I'm thinking primarily about this fall when the vast majority of 1Ls are going to begin. Well, um, so I'm going to unpack that in a couple ways. The first is one of the things I started doing was not allowing my students to put up a black screen or the picture of themselves, that you had to be face to face. And that was really important, not just for me and not just for them to stay focused, but also for the rest of the class. And I think that, you know, I also ask students, you know, to get dressed and I, you know, I get dressed every day and, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen the John Kaczynski where he wears a suit on the top <laughs> and he is wearing shorts on the bottom, what you wear down there, you know, in the bottom. But, but I think that, that I, Whereas I didn't feel permission to be demanding last semester because we were all thrown into it. I feel permission to be demanding this semester. Another thing that's changed from last semester to this semester, and this is true everywhere, is that we let students take pass fail grades last semester. And now we're saying this is the new normal, you have to go for grades. So that's something else. Um, but the other thing you talked about is, is the fall. And I don't know what's going to happen in the fall, but I do know that schools are seriously rethinking how to deliver an in-class experience in the fall. So one, one of the ways, and this is true also at, I know Columbia Business School is thinking about this, and so are we. One thing that could happen is half the class comes one day and the other half listens online, and then you switch it to the other half the class the other day, you know, and so you can have the social distancing. I do, th I know too that um, the American Bar Association and the American Association of Law Schools are putting out webinars and everyone's kind of upping their game from a faculty standpoint um, to deliver this as best that they can. So let's, if you don't mind, if you're able, I'd, I'd love to go deeper on that in terms of upping their game from the faculty perspective. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean more engaging professors, more engaging teaching styles. Yeah, what, what I think I think I think more engaging teaching styles. I don't, you know, it's interesting. I think that first of all, it's so much harder to prepare for class when you're preparing online. It used to be I've taught contracts for twenty years. I'll be very honest. You know, I'm always honest. And I would pick up the book five minutes before class, thumb my way through it, walk in. I knew the cases. I taught them a million times. And I'd let the students do the heavy lifting. I'd say, what happened in this case? And they'd have to answer. Well, you can't do that when you're online. You have to really have command of the classroom. So one of the things that we are all doing is we're rethinking how we're looking at cases. One of the things I'm doing is I'm pushing the problems in the case a lot more than I used to. It used to be when we were in the classroom, there would be so many questions that we could riff. And now it's focusing me um, to bring in kind of those in-class experiments more. That's good. I, and I think that's true of all student faculty. Every faculty I've spoken to has said that they're, prepared, they're spending three times as much time preparing for class than they ever did. And if you're spending three times as much time preparing for class, you're clearly doing something else. The other thing is that many professors, myself included to a degree, kind of had the Kingsfield model, which is from the paper chase, where you went in and it was two hours of just lecture. 
Well, now we're trying to be creative. So we're learning about breakout rooms. We're learning about showing video clips. We're learning about, um, we're learning about flipped classrooms. A lot of, that's a lot of big talk now. The flipped classroom is where instead of speak, teaching the language and then giving the problems afterwards, we lecture on the, the law, the language, and then we only classroom is reserved for doing problems. So I think that's been a lot of experience too that, that people are working toward. Nice, nice, very interesting. Yeah. So for those aren't who aren't experience, uh, familiar, the flipped classroom model pioneered by I think the Khan Academy, Salman Khan, where students watch the lecture videos at home for homework and then actually spend time in class interacting in small groups, working through the problems, doing the homework in class, watching the lectures on demand prior. And you know, it's interesting. I bet you the case books are going to change as a result of this too, because most law school case books are just case after case after case. And I think that, and they were starting to have a little bit of this flipped classroom aspect to it. I think that it's going to change a lot. I think this is really going to change the way people teach law. Um, so we teach based on the Langdellian method of the Socratic method. And one of the problems that law schools have faced is, is you know, the internet's been around since, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years, but law school never changed its teaching model ever. And for some reason, law faculty just debated it and couldn't figure out how to deliver it. And again, that comes from this idea that we're not really teaching you the law as much as we're teaching you to think differently. And so because of the pandemic, what's grown of that is that we are now forced to think differently about how we deliver a legal education. Right. And so looking ahead even further now, because my students, and by the way, folks, feel free to type questions in the chat and we'll work them into the conversation here. My students, most of them are looking to apply to law school this fall to start in fall 2021. Mm -hmm. So while some might be looking to start in a couple months, most will start over a year from now. So right. you, we've been discussing the short term, which is obviously what we're better able to predict, if anything. But yeah. what could we, where do you see this going over a year from now if the trend continues of innovating in legal education? And then, of course, at the same time, social distancing may be here, although I certainly hope well, not. Let's hope not. <laughs> let's hope not. Yeah, I certainly hope not. Don't even say it. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my goodness. Don't say that. Yeah. What, what could the long term consequences be? Even if, even if things in a yeah. social distancing perspective move back to normal, a lot of the legal education changes may continue. Right. So where, where can we be over a year from now? I think that the ABA is going to relax its distance, the, the number of credits you can get distance learning. Right now, you can only take 15 of your 80 or whatever it is, 85 credits in a distance learning class. And the distance learning class is a class that delivers 50% or more. So not even 100%. Um, they still want you to have some on campus. So I think that's going to change. And there's been some talk about it changing and um, before this all happened. And I think this will push that envelope, which will change where you decide to go to law school. So two things could happen. One thing which I hope doesn't happen is that some schools will now offer, you know, they don't need a number of seats. So like we're dictated, Pays Law is dictated by the number of seats we can fit into our classrooms. Our classrooms, you know, we have three classrooms that can feed 70 seats, so we can't take more than 200 students a year. But if we don't need seats, then we can take more students. I don't think that will happen to the second, third, definitely not fourth tier. I think it will happen at the first tier, the middle of the second tier, which means that those lower school, the, the lower tiered schools are really going to be in trouble. That's something I do worry about. Um, so that's one thing. That, that, that is this idea of distance learning. Another issue is that law school's always been three years. And I'm wondering too, with the idea of off-campus learning, if it can become shorter. Now, this is just me speaking. This, there's no movement I put on this, but it's another thought. Interesting. So on that first point, I was really interested because that impacts things on the law school admissions side a lot, right? right? So if right top and middle, high, high to middle tier schools could accept far more students. They get those tuition dollars. They don't have to have literal bodies in seats and they right. could admit more students and they could probably afford to take a slight hit in the rankings in terms of lowering LSAT and GPA medians. Right. Right. But then schools below them 
will not get enough bodies, not get enough tuition, and be at risk of closure potentially. Is that cor- right. correct? I, that's that. That's what I fear. Yeah. Interesting. And let me let me be clear. If I if one had a choice between going to a higher rank school online or a lower rank school not online, you know, in person, I would always recommend going to school in person. I guess what I'm saying is that if you have to start school online, there's, there's not a big downside if it's that or try to find a job and you don't have a job. You can learn, but it's much better to learn in the classroom. And the other thing is that you become, the people you go to law school with become your peers in your network. And so if you want, want to refer cases to each other 10 years down the road, or if you want to look for a new job. So, the, so, online, so that is, is, it's better to be in a community. I personally cannot stand U.S. News and World Report. I've written an article. I wrote an article called Ratings Fetishism. It troubles me that that's what students base decisions on, but it is what it is. Well, I think there's also in recent years, at least in my audience, there's been a lot more awareness around the benefits of significant scholarship money. Yes. So lower yeah, ranked yeah. school for yeah. free or for significantly yeah. lower cost, lower debt. So that's mm-hmm. a factor to mix in as well for the online versus in person. I think that's true. And I, we have some spectacular students that, you know, probably could have gone somewhere else, but we, you know, got the scholarship and do very well. I mean, that's the thing about law school too, is that where you go to law school, if you go to the top 14, it certainly affects your first job, but then everyone is, the the playing field becomes very even by your second job, because after that, where you went to law school is not as important as where your first job was, how you did it, your first job, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. One other thing I've been thinking about, we discussed this on your podcast recently, was, the, of course, the LSAT going online, the mm-hmm. LSAT flex. Mm-hmm. Law school exams for this spring semester, I would imagine, were also administered online. What was that like? Well, you know, it's weird. Funny you should ask. I just graded them. <laughs> the problem is that... So, so there's two things. When you're in law school, you can have your exam closed book or open book. I give my in when is when we're in the classroom. I always give a closed book exam, and the reason why I give a closed book exam is because the bar is closed book, and you're going to have to take the bar. So I want to uh, simulate the bar. I'm in the minority. Most of them are open book, but even though they're open book, we have, and I'm sure that your listeners are familiar with this exam soft, which basically prevents you from googling or anything. So this year, I knew that I was going to give an open book exam and that they were going to be home and some people were going to be with their parents who were lawyers and some people were going to be living in, you know, a basement by themselves. And I wanted to eat in the playing field. And so what I did was I told them in advance, I told them, I told them in advance what the questions were. And what I judged them on was their ability to write a strong answer. And they, I was very impressed. So, but I think that, and, and I heard is I have a friend who teaches at Scarsdale High School, of all places, which is right. And she was saying that what they're doing for some of their tests is they're, again, giving the students the answer and saying to the students, here's the answer, what's right about it, what's wrong about it? Because that stuff you can't Google. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I guess that that's the, Short answer to your question, if it is a short answer. Interesting. So they're, they, they were critiquing a, a model answer that wasn't necessarily perfect. Right. But was, like, but was decent enough where it was largely correct, but there were still some issues to fix. Exactly. Because you can't, that's, you know, I mean, I don't want to think my students cheat. I want to hope that they do not cheat. But the truth of the matter is that um, I don't want to deal with it if they do cheat. It's a nightmare if people cheat. You have to go through the honor board and people hate that. And so it's really problematic. These died. So, um, so I just figured I'm giving them, I'm going to tell them what's on the exam and then see the quality that they answer it. Right. I like that a lot. So this exam soft software, I'm curious about what exactly it's like to take an exam under this. You mentioned that it prevents one from Googling. Right. Does it have any other monitoring like webcam or microphone? I don't know enough about it, but as I understand it, it basically turns your computer into a PC or into a, not a PC, what, what? Well, it locks, it locks it down. Yeah, it locks it down. It locks it down. There is, I've heard, there's some software where they can tell, the computer screen can tell if you look away from the screen. 
Well, that's the one for the LSAT Flex, actually. Oh, Proctor oh there U. you go. Right, right, yeah, right. for Proctor U for LSAT Flex, they, yeah. they, they screen share your screen so they can see everything that's on it. They close all the other programs and they monitor your eye movements using AI. So well, what they can, if you have to go to the bathroom or something? You're not allowed to go to the bathroom. <gasps> How yeah. long is the how long is the test? Well, that's why they shortened the LSAT for online. It went from five sections to three sections, so you're done in two hours. Oh wow. Apparently the limits of the human body are two hours on average, oh, according to go. them. There you go. There you go. Well, you know, it's interesting. So another issue was so I gave a three hour exam and I gave four and a half hours because I gave them time to download it, print it out, read it, upload it. And a lot of faculty did that. And so for students who had extended time, you lost your extended, some people lost their extended time because the time was so long anyway. Um, so that, I thought that was an interesting thing too. Yeah, yeah. For the LSAT Flex, they, if you have extra time, they give you a bathroom break in that circumstance, but not under ordinary circumstances. Right, right, so right. they're not totally consistent, but they're doing the best they can, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is the thing. And, you know, if you cheat, you're only cheating yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what else has been noteworthy to you with regard to the moving of legal education online or what entering right. one else might expect otherwise? Well, I think, I think it's sad to lose community. Um, our faculty has faculty meetings. We, today we had faculty lunch. Um, so we're trying to keep our community alive. I don't know what the students are doing about all their, like, um, their groups like the Environmental Law Society or the Women's Law Society, I don't know how those are operating or not operating. Um, that stuff can be a little difficult. I have office hours by Zoom. I just basically am doing every, I'm doing everything I would do, but I'm doing it by Zoom. So other than, the, you know, it's, it's funny, I was saying to my students, I usually buy them pizza at the end of the semester. So we were trying to figure out when we could have that, you know, pizza party in the distant future. But I think, well, the other thing that's interesting is a lot of faculty are older, a lot, right? And so they're not used to technology. But I have to say that I have not encountered any faculty member who has been scared to embrace it. I think everyone is kind of, in an odd way, excited by switching up the norm. And so, you know, that's been interesting too. I mean, I don't look. Would we prefer to be in the classroom? Absolutely. But if we can't be in the classroom, I am sh in shock and pleasantly by how enthusiastically the faculty I know are embracing this. It's impressive. Well, everyone's doing the best they can, right? It may not be ideal, but the show must go on. Folks have right. to finish law school. Folks have to go to law school. We still need right. lawyers, still right. need to educate folks. And, and I think we're heartbroken for our students. You know, we're heartbroken for our students that the bar has been postponed. We're heartbroken for our students that they're not on campus for their barrister's ball and, and all of the things that go along with that. And that we didn't, we had a virtual graduation, which wasn't quite the same as a real graduation. Um, you know, I feel like the two L's are in the sweet spot because hopefully this will be over by the time that they graduate and they were ha able to have enough, um, one enough in class experience. So. Right. With the bar exam, give us an update on that because I've heard that, so like the California bar, for example, was postponed. We don't know when that's going to happen. Right, right. What's happening in, with the New York bar? Well, and I don't know if I have the most recent information, so don't quote me, but I, as I understand it, the New York Bar is going to be in, um, in September. And the Florida Bar is going to be in July. And these are both going to be in person or online? In person. They're going to be in person. You know, there's a movement, actually, there's a, another podcast called Above the Law, and Above the Law, not, it's called Thinking Like a Lawyer, it's by Above the Law, and so they just had on the president of the Student Bar Association, the American Bar Association student president, and there's all these different um, iterations, some, some states are pushing for just not having a bar and giving everyone a certificate of practice. The problem with that is that the bar really tests your ability to represent a client in a way. Um, so this is the thing, and this is the takeaway for students who are studying to go to law school. As I said earlier, law schools really study your ability to make a rule-based argument. 
The bar tests your ability to make a rule-based argument. All of this is done in the context of substantive classes, criminal law, contracts, torts, what have you. But the idea is that you have to stand up one day and represent a client in front of a judge. And you have to do it in a way that's different than picking an opinion and just advocating stealthily for it. And that's the purpose of the bar exam. And so they call it a bar to practice. That's why it's the bar exam. So I do think it's important. I think it's going to be in September. I, I mean, you know, it's funny. I was thinking today, I don't know the answer. One of the bar courses revving up. I just don't know. Right. No, it's useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what other updates? Anything else to share around all these changes? Well, I think one of the things is that the schools are working hard to figure out how to be in class. So I think that's good news. Um, I think that this idea that we are, this is our new normal for now and that everyone who's teaching going forward is doing it in a very thoughtful way. I think the fact that we are now grading again means that the we're going to deliver something to the students that they have to then, on their end, it's going to be more demanding of them to push themselves to learn. So I think while this, you know, is not ideal, I think that it is as good as it can be under the circumstances and probably better than people anticipated. Well, that's good to hear. And it sounds like everyone's adapting. Yeah. Do you plan to cover any of this or have you covered any of this recently on the Law to Fact podcast? So it's interesting. When we first started, um, so I, 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 used to, I post every Tuesday, right? So the, when this all went down, I did back to back. How did, uh, well, actually, let me, let me take a step back. Nina Cohn is a professor in, at Syracuse University, and she's the, one of the leading professors on how to do an online, how to teach online classes. And Syracuse has gotten from the ABA special dispensation to do online classes. So totally coincidentally, my last podcast before the coronavirus kind of put us on lockdown, we're in New York, was with Nina Cohn, and she talked about the value of online learning. Then we had this, and then I interviewed one of the women who's uh, Professor Bridget Crawford from Pace, who is like a leader in the country on online learning. And she, we talked about how to create an online class. We talked about it for faculty. And then our next podcast was how students should, you know, student preparedness and how to learn online. So I kind of did those three all together. And then what happened was I got so busy because it takes so much time that Fortunately, I've had a few podcasts in the can, but um, I really, it was hard for me to keep up with my podcasts. So um, I have one or two coming out now, and then I always take a summer hiatus anyway, and then we'll be back in the fall. Well, that's good. That'll give you plenty of time to catch up. Yes, exactly. Well, I will definitely provide everyone with the information on your podcast and encourage everyone to check Great. it out, Law to Fact yep, Podcast, so they can stay Thank up to you. date on what you're up to there. Thanks, and Steve. And I appreciate you taking the time, and we'll continue to be in touch as things unfold. Terrific. I appreciate having the chance to talk with you. And as always, I just, I think you're the LSAT guru and um, your ears should be ringing when I'm not with you. In fact, just yesterday I was on a hike with someone whose daughter wants to go to law school. And I said, oh, you have to check out Steve Schwartz's blog. Well, I really appreciate that, Leslie. Thank you. Everyone, Thank you. Uh, Leslie, feel free to sign off, but everyone, please stick okay. around. I want to share a few updates for you all on the okay, LSAT great. Flex today. Okay. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. Leslie. Bye. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.